Angel fans, the Angels signed somebody. And it wasn't a depth move. It was Robert Stevenson. He's now a halo. He's a bullpen piece that the Angels desperately need. And the question everybody's asking is, who? And is he good? So we're going to talk about Robert Stevenson today. It's time to get locked on with Mike and John. And this is Locked On Angels. You are Locked On Angels, your daily Los Angeles Angels podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On Angels your first listen of the day. You can find this anywhere you get your podcast, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Sirius XM by searching Locked On Angels. And if you want to give back to the Super Halo Bros for all the Super Halo content, here's some things that you can do. Leave us a rate and a review on Apple Podcasts. If you're watching on YouTube, Hit that thumbs up button. And if you're not subscribed already, please subscribe and become a Locked On Every Dayer. And whether you're watching or listening, come over to YouTube, leave a comment. It's one of the best ways to get in touch with us and be a part of the conversation. And today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. You can make every moment more. And right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. Happy Monday to you. And thanks for being here for this episode of Locked On Angels, where it's your team every day. You've got the Frisch Brothers here with you, a.k.a. the Super. Halo Bros, my name is John, and that's my brother Mike. And my name is Mike, and that's my brother John. Just a friendly reminder that we're dropping episodes Monday, Wednesday, Friday, right up until spring training, and then we'll be back to five days a week. I don't know about you, Mike, but for me, especially like because I do a lot of the post editing stuff, when, when there's a day in between, it feels like a million years yeah, that's between <laughs> episodes. And we hope Why our lock grown since the last episode. John? I know <laughs> my beard's grown too. Uh, listen, uh, we hope that our everydayers feel the same way as well. We miss you guys in between those episodes. Second, uh, there's just a little over a week left to vote for us for best baseball podcast in the 2024 sports podcast awards. If you haven't done so already, Take the time to jump into the episode description. Follow that link, whether you're watching or listening, and you can vote for us right there on the page. Thank you to so many everydayers who have voted and let us know that they have. We are grateful and truly appreciative of that. Mike, on today's show, the Angels got a really great reliever in Robert Stevenson. A lot of people said, who's this guy? Is he any yeah. good? Well, yeah. we're going to find out together. So let's get us uh, going here. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Robert Stevenson. Yeah, let me reset the conversation here. This is from MLB Trade Rumors. So the Angels agreed to a three-year deal with Robert Stevenson with an option for 2027. Uh, the deal obviously is pending a physical. Things should be fine. He'll be able to go through and they'll they'll sign him and probably have a press conference hopefully this week. Uh, Stevenson was the top remaining free agent reliever once Josh Hader came off the board. He signed five by the deal, Astros by the $95 way. $95 million dollar deal. Woo! Yeah, so a three-year guarantee for Stevenson, it would have seemed a bit crazy about six months ago, but things kind of changed for him, and it really began last summer. He was kind of volatile as a middle innings arm, and this guy really, really struggled when he first came up and was up and down in his career. He was a former first-round pick and a highly regarded prospect with the Reds, but again, struggled early in his career, was a starter. Then he moved to relief for uh, the full-time position in 2019. And again, up and down, had some good moments, had some bad moments. He had a sub four ERA in 2019. And then in 2021 was also sub four. 2022, Johnny was really, really difficult. He split yeah. years with the Rockies and, and the Pirates, had a five, four, three ERA through 58 innings. Hey, that would be bad for an angel bullpen guy, right? <laughs> and so then uh, Stevenson opened up last season with 14 innings pitched, and he gave up nine runs with the Pittsburgh Pirates, then was traded in June to the Rays. And our good buddy, Lindsey Crosby, always says, if the Rays want your guys, you need to take a second look at your guys, right? And so the Rays traded for this guy, and it changed everything for him, John. He was arguably the most dominant pitcher in the majors during the final four months. During his time in Tampa, he had a 2.35 ERA in almost 40 innings pitched. He punched out 42.9% of hitters, John, and only walked 6% oh, of the thank, batters that he faced. Thank goodness. We <laughs> needed that for sure. Yeah, definitely. So among all of the relievers that have had 30-plus innings pitched after June 1st, only Felix Batista, Araldis Chapman, and Pete Fairbanks punched out more hitters at a higher rate. Some pretty Steven. good company right there. Yeah. yeah. Even if even if that's not how uh, you can really hone in on how overpowering he's been pitch for pitch, according to MLB trade rumors, they say they that opponents whiffed more often than they made contact 
against him. Hitters put the bat on the ball 49.3% of their swings against Stevenson while he was with Tampa Bay. Wasn't the best mark in MLB. It was almost 10 percentage points lower than anyone else over that same stretch. Chapman against uh, batters who made contact on 59% of their swings was second. And so wow. nearly 10% better than Aroldis Chapman. Mike, overall, his stats from 2023, a 310 ERA in 52 and a third innings pitch last year. Again, an incredible ERA, 235 with the Rays. He went from the Pirates to the Rays. That really seemed to be the change that made Stevenson so highly sought after. Now, we have to note, three years with an option mm -hmm. for $11 million a year, 33 total. Do you like this move? Uh, do you take into consideration the $11 million? Uh, what do you think about this move? Tell me. They're not spending any money, so I don't think the $11 million is that big of a deal, quite honestly. <laughs> but, John, this is what they needed. They needed another bullpen arm, and they hmm. needed somebody that could be at the back end of that bullpen and help maybe offset some of the saves with Carlos Estevez back there because sure. we saw with Reynaldo Lopez and Estevez, it was a good one-two punch. And even with Matt Moore, it was a good one-two punch. And so yeah. I think Stevenson is a guy that can come in and can – be there in the seventh and be there in the eighth and maybe even be there in the ninth. And if, if Estevez struggles, you have a guy that you can go to that you're confident in. And this is Estevez's last year, unless they extend him. And so you have a, a back of the end guy that you have for the next three years, possibly next four years. And he's not that old. He's in his thirties and it'll be 30, 34. I think when he's, when he's done with this possibly four year deal, I, I like the move Johnny, because the angels need, a really strong bullpen and we've seen year after year after year with their starters struggling to go five, six innings, they've needed to rely on their bullpen a whole lot. And so I think that this is a really strong move for the angels. I think maybe one more move in the bullpen would be a really strong move for the angels. Matt Moore, maybe baby. Matt Moore. Yes. I was going to say Matt Moore. That would make sense. Do you I think, wonder if, do you ahead. think that Matt Moore is upset that he got wavered to Cleveland. I was just going to ask that question. I was just thinking the same thing. I wonder if he's frustrated or if there's any tension getting waved that way, or is he a professional and he understands how the game works? I think he understands how the game works because number one, he did go from a team that was out of contention to a team with the exact same record who was in contention yeah. with Cleveland in the AL central. Now Cleveland obviously, you know, was just as bad as the angels record wise, but right. the AL central is so much easier to get in and get into the playoffs there. And so he was a part of that, but then he got wavered to the Marlins and couldn't play on the playoff team, but then the Marlins ended up getting in the playoffs as well. So I know that he hopped around a lot and I know that it was a frustrating for fans cost cutting move yeah. on the angels part, but I, I have to believe that perhaps he understands the business side of things. Now, if he's got an experience with the angels from last year, that, was ho-hum or wasn't so great, that might be different. However, with a new coaching staff, that might be some incentive to come back. I still think that he would be a great move, Mike. But as far as the Stevenson move goes, $11 million a year makes me a little bit nervous for a reliever because relievers are so volatile. Uh, you know that when you sign somebody who's coming off a great year, it's not always guaranteed to happen again. And we saw that with like Aaron Liu, right? I yeah. think, however, the difference, and we'll talk about this in segment two, but the difference is I think that you can trust a high velo guy more than you can trust somebody like a, a soft tossing lefty like mm. Aaron Loop, who requires a lot of stuff to be hit on the ground, requires a good defense behind him, requires some good BABIP luck, not bad BABIP luck in batting yeah. average on balls in play, because we saw a lot of unlucky little hits and bloops and dinky doos off of Aaron loop. And so I think that you can trust that somebody who's throwing a little bit harder and also generating the swing and miss stuff that he's getting. I think that's the kind of thing that sustains once you, once you learn that in your career with the Rays. And so yes, $11 million for a reliever is pretty significant. That's, that's not chump change for a relief right. guy, right? But you think about um, the guys who have been signed and uh, who's the guy that um, uh, with the Cardinals and then 
He just got signed by the Giants, and they want to make him a reliever. Um, we've talked about him a million oh, times. Aaron Hicks. Was Aaron Hicks or yes. no? Yeah. Uh, it, his last name is Hicks. Hicks. Jordan yeah. Hicks. Jordan Hicks, um, thank you. Not Aaron Hicks. We don't want him pitching. No. <laughs> uh, Jordan Hicks um, signed for around the same amount of money, I think, and they want to make him a starter. And if it doesn't yeah. work out, he can be a reliever again. But yeah. it, it this market is so strange. And, you know, we've had a lot of people say this. Who wants to play for the Angels? Robert Stevenson does for $11 million. And I think that's the key is if you want to yeah. bring people to Anaheim, then you're going to have to incentivize it with some years, with the dollar amount. That's why the option's there for the fourth year. I think you, if you're the Angels and you're in the position that you're in and, you know, by all accounts, nobody wants to play here, quote unquote, then you got to incentivize it. You got to sweeten the pot. Am I right? Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And it makes me wonder what they'll do next if they do another move like this. Will it be a Bellinger and bring him in? Will it be a, a Chapman and bring him in? I would lean more in Bellinger's direction than Chapman. Or would they go after a starter like a Blake Snell, somebody like that that would be able to come in or, or a Montgomery to come in and pitch for them? And does this does this hinder uh, what they spend on that person or what they're able to offer on that person. Cause there's still a question about the Bally's money. Right. And the angels have kind of just been sitting this off season. Ken Rosenthal was on foul territory. And he said that the angels are just looking to add wherever they can. Mm -hmm. They're looking to add pieces that can make them better without. And I love this. He said, without having to push one of their young guys aside. And so that kind of makes good. sense why the, the off season has gone in the way that it's gone so that, these young guys are not getting tossed aside like Joe Adele. Like, oh, we're just going to put him in the minor leagues and let him figure it out. There, there really is a belief that a lot of these guys are ready to really perform. And I think a lot of it has to do with the coaching staff. So, John, do you think that this hinders any sort of move moving forward and that the other moves will be small moves? Or do you think there's one more big move in the Angels' back pocket? Well, they had $70 million before they hit the first luxury tax. That leaves $59 million. Uh, before they hit that first luxury tax, still plenty of space to play with Mike. And, yeah, and I know right. some people were concerned about like, well, that kind of eats into what they have to spend. But like you said, they weren't spending, they no. weren't spending on anything of significance. Yeah. We've seen a lot of minor league moves. We've seen some moderate, you know, major league moves that are like a million here. I think who was it that got 4 million for the bullpen? Was it uh Oh, it was Luis Garcia got like 4 mm -hmm. million for the pen. And this is not that kind of move where it's four million for the pen. This is a guy you want to lock up for a while and have around. And I think that Perry and Code like trust that he can sustain what he's learned with the Rays. Speaking of which, we want to thank you for making Locked On Angels your first listen of the day. We're just getting started and coming up on Locked On Angels, we're going to get into exactly just that. How did Stevenson improve so much after being traded to the Rays? And do we think it's sustainable with the Angels? Or is it going to go the path of a uh, career year and then perhaps revert back to who he was? Well, we'll talk about why we think that's going to be sustainable coming right up. Locked on Angels is brought to you by our friends at eBay Motors. Passion, drive, patience. It's what brings home a winning trophy. It's also what keeps your automobile alive and on the road for you. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers to roof racks to exhaust kits to led headlights i think you need those john for your car and so much more whether you're into speed or power or style ebay motors has got you covered with 122 million parts for your car or truck or suv you'll always find exactly what you're looking for i don't know that i need leds because i don't like them shining back at me but you know if that's you i i, I that that works for you. <laughs> hurt my eyes too. Yeah, it's absolutely. Getting old. Come on. <laughs> absolutely. So what, what I love about actually about eBay uh, eBay Motors is that they, they have the eBay guarantee fit. Uh, if your part that you pick out doesn't fit, you can send it back and they're going to give you your money back. They guarantee that it will fit your ride. Truck, car, SUV, whatever you got. With eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. See what we did there? With all the parts that you need at prices that you want, it's easy to turn your car or truck or SUV into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your automobile alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply, and the eBay guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. 
Thanks for making Locked On Angels your first listen of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. And Locked On Everydayers, don't forget that Locked On has launched the first ever 24-7 national sports streaming channel over on YouTube. Just search Locked On Sports today, and you can have 24-7 coverage of all the top stories of the day in the sports world from the local experts of Locked On and the national shows as well let's see will i be tuning in to listen to brian peacock talk about the 49ers on locked on 49ers (laughs) probably i think i'm gonna do that after the show mike so go on over to locked on sports today on youtube and subscribe and be part of the first ever national sports 24 7 streaming channel we mentioned it but stevenson's career changed dramatically when he got traded to tampa And so the question is, what happened? So this is good, Johnny. According to an article from Adam Barry at MLB.com, Stevenson had a conversation with Kyle Snyder, who is the Rays pitching coach. Kyle gave him a couple of tips related to the positioning of his hand on the ball and the mentality behind it. And just like that, John, Stevenson's heavily used breaking ball transformed from an 83 to 85 mile an hour offering with some horizontal sweep into an 88 to 90 mile an hour offering with more vertical movement. Hmm. He also threw a fastball in the upper 90s and a splitter to keep left-handed hitters off balance, but the slider remains his primary weapon. And that pitch yielded a 083 opponent's batting average and a 59.5% whiff rate since he introduced it. So StatCast classifies the harder breaking ball as a cutter, differentiating it from his old breaking ball, but Stevenson still refers to as as, as a slider, and he can. It's his pitch. He can do whatever he wants, right? <laughs> so whatever you call it, it's made him into a legitimate late-inning weapon for Tampa Bay. Yeah, I think that's fascinating that he developed that cutter from his old slider, but then he's been able to keep that old slider. And l- listen, uh, th- the article says here, the results after the change were staggering. After posting a 5.14 ERA, a 1.43 whip and a 2.13 strikeout to walk ratio in 18 appearances with the Pirates. He put together a 2.93 ERA, 0.72 whip, three quarters of a person getting on base per inning, Mike, (laughs) and a six strikeout to walk ratio. That's six strikeouts for every one walk, which is a great ratio, and a whip rate that still ranks among baseball's best since the trade. So, What specifically changed? Here's what Stevenson had to say. The first thing is trusting the approach that these guys instill in us. I think that's been a huge part of the success. Mm. Also, just tinkering with my slider a little bit, adding a little velo. I think that's helped a lot. So combination of those things and really just trusting the catchers we have back there. The approach Stevenson mentioned is a simple one that's helped many pitchers improve with the Rays. The approach is trust your stuff. Do mm-hmm. what you do best, attack the zone, and throw strikes. Mike! John, that's what Tyler Glasnow talked about. Tyler Glasnow oh, talked yeah. about how awesome it was to be on this team and that they would say, trust your stuff, here's some tweaks, do what you do best, attack the zone, throw strikes. And I love that it was it was literally just a tip. Hey, if you hold the ball this way, mm-hmm. instead of holding the ball that way, the guy gained five miles an hour on his pitch. Right. And it became a, a dominant <laughs> pitch for him. That's amazing. Yeah, and listen, do you think that those that mentality, trust your stuff, do what you do best, attack the zone, throw strikes, does that sound like Barry Enright? Does that sound like what we've heard from Barry Enright so far in this offseason? It absolutely does. It sounds just like what Barry Enright wants to do. And I go back to the conversation he had about Reed Detmers and something that he noticed in Detmers and already had a conversation with him about it. And it was moving all of his momentum towards the plate instead of 90% of him towards the plate and 5% was falling off of the mound. And he said, as you do that, you're going to have more momentum. You're going to have more speed on your pitches and you'll have more vertical break when you throw these pitches because every part of you is moving forward. You're not fighting against yourself. And and Barry Enright noticed that stuff. And, and that's the thing, Johnny, that I, I, I'm i going to bang this drum all season long. Mm-hmm. I think that we have been in a, in a world where our coaches are about as good as us, right? And, and, and <laughs> I and think we're better, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll give us credit. But they're about as good as us in our everydayers, right? We're noticing things. And I think that these guys, it didn't seem like they were noticing things. If they weren't noticing things, or if they were, they weren't 
pointing them out and they weren't mm-hmm. correcting them at a rate that was fast and that was helping these these pitchers. And I think Enright is somebody that is noticing stuff and he's going to begin to communicate that stuff. And I think we're going to see these guys really rise to the occasion and be a whole lot better than they were last year. I just want to address the idea that, you know, anytime somebody comes here, they're going to regress. And certainly we, we've we seen that. We saw that with Aaron Luke. We saw that with Tyler Anderson. But to your point, Mike, I think that Barry Enright is the perfect pitching coach to have this season. Long ago, during the middle of the season, you and I were frustrated with Aaron Liu. And there was an article that came out that said that the emphasis was to get guys to swing and miss and try to strike everybody out, which is the kind of pitcher that Aaron Loop has never been. Like he right. gets his strikeouts, he gets guys to swing on the slider and whatnot, but he's a ground ball guy and that's been his bread and butter. And when you come here and you can't rely on your bread and butter anymore, it changes you. And you and I noticed that his extension was down. He wasn't going toward the plate, driving toward the plate further than he was when he was having a lot of success. And that's what I think is hilarious is like you and I have identified some small things that only outside observers can be able to identify. Right. But when it comes to a drop off after having a career year, I think you have to consider this. I think you have to consider the fact that a Tyler Anderson coming from the Dodgers was also very much a change-up guy where he's getting guys to hit things on the ground and things like that. And the emphasis on striking guys out was a big problem for him because he would throw the fastball change-up combo with the emphasis on the strikeout. But really, he should have been throwing that change-up under the bat to get guys to hit it into the ground. And right. so it's more of a compatibility issue. These guys just didn't suddenly suck. It's a compatibility issue when they come to the angels and they tell them to do something completely different than what they're good at. And I think that's been the problem in the last few years. And case in point here, uh, Chaz long, uh, somebody we follow on Twitter has some great baseball takes some great angels takes. He noted that Brooks Raley is a great example of somebody who went to the Rays and improved mm-hmm. and took that success with him to the next team. Listen to this. In 2021, Brooks Raley was with the Astros. He pitched to a 4.78 ERA in 58 games, and he had a 90 ERA plus, 10% below league average. The next year with the Rays, he got into 60 games and pitched to a 2.68 ERA, Mike. He nearly cut that in half with a 137 ERA plus, 37% better than league average. Then after he leaves the Rays, and you can imagine people are probably having the same conversations last offseason about Rayleigh that we're having right now about Stevenson. Sure. He'll regress. He's going to fall off because he's right. not the Rays anymore. Sure. He got into 66 games with the Mets in 2023, pitched to a 2.80 ERA. Wow. And a 151 ERA plus. So Brooks mm. Rayleigh is somebody who carried over whatever tweaks, whatever Uh, things that he changed with the race. He carried that over to the Mets. And then you mentioned it earlier, Stevenson's uh, pitches and the way that they've changed over the years, man, I am like fascinated by how the Rays changed his pitches, including this, the, the cutter that he developed was worth a run value of plus 12, meaning essentially in situations where runs could be scored, it prevented 12 runs from being scored. Uh, It had a 59.9% whiff rate, a 51.2% K rate. And then he's got this splitter, Mike, that not a lot of people are talking about. It was good for a run value of plus two, a 157 expected batting average against that splitter, a 42.2% whiff rate, and a 35% K rate. Listen to the expected on his cutter, 1.2, or sorry, point. 121 batting average against wow. expected batting average on that cutter. So he's made some fundamental changes to what he's done. And I don't think that's the kind of stuff that like falls out of the back of your head. Once sure. you learn it, you have it, right? Sure. Yeah, I think so. And that's what's really exciting about having Stevenson here, but also really exciting about having Barry Enright here because we have a pitching coach that is going to already know those things or at least have that information. And so if something starts to change, he can make quick corrections. And obviously there's more that Robert Stevenson can learn about pitching and that maybe Barry Enright can help him with. So that's why I'm not concerned about him performing with the angels this year and why I'm not concerned that they gave him some extra bucks to come here because I think he's going to be a huge asset for this angels bullpen. And the one thing I'll say too is 
Enright in his Q&A with Sam Blum of The Athletic, and even Johnny Washington said the same thing. They're not trying to put guys in this box that the Angels think that they need to be in. They're going to play to their strengths and continue to see that as the season moves forward. John, I am just a little bit excited about this bullpen. And I know that we're Don't walking you do into it. Don't this. You do it. No expectations, but tell me, tell me what you think about a bullpen. If you're just reading this off a page and a bullpen that had Luis Garcia and Adam Simber, it had Estevez, Soriano, Caceres, Bachman, Joyce, possibly Zach Plesak. He might be in the bullpen. He might be, you know, maybe an extra starter, that long reliever, John, and then you add Robert Stevenson in mm. like I, I like on paper and let's just be clear on paper. Yeah. I like this bullpen. I really like this bullpen. Now I know that things can fall apart and we've seen things fall apart. I get it. I was excited when we got Aaron loop and when we got to para and thought that those were some good moves for us. And of course didn't work out for us. Right. But John, is it possible that the angels have uh, a plus bullpen i was gonna say elite but then i stopped myself a, a plus <laughs> bullpen like is this a is this a a positive for this team well every team has to have guys that throw really hard in their bullpen that's that's a given and so you yeah. see like ben joyce is gonna throw hard Soriano's gonna throw hard sd throws hard luis garcia throws hard stevenson can get it up to 97 kelvin caceres also 97 but then you got to have your your funky Jimmy Hergits. You got to have your Adam Simbers. And I know Simber had an off year last year. He attributed that to injury. We'll see. And hopefully he can, I mean, so far what he's spoken about, he seems to be confident that he can get back to, you know, being the great off-speed guy that he's been in yeah. the past. But all of this to say, Mike, I think that the best thing about this bullpen is you can get some different looks at the mm. plate. You're not going to mm. come up there and have the same kind of pitch every single time. A lot of guys throw hard, but that also sets them up for the off-speed stuff. It sets them up yeah. for, you know, the the cutter that Stevenson can throw or the slider he can throw or even that splitter. You have options and I think that's important. I also think that, you know, there's a lot of question marks about this bullpen. Obviously, Luis Garcia is somebody he's a little bit older. He can throw really hard. So that's a plus Adam Simber again with the injury. That's a big question. You also have to wonder if Jose Suarez is going to be part of that bullpen as maybe like a long relief guy yeah. as well. He is a lefty, so that does help. And he always is better in short bursts rather right. than starting or going really long into a game. I still think I would like to see one more move. I think that you alluded to that earlier. I think a lefty in Matt Moore would be fantastic for this team. But at the end of the day, I really think that they have something something good here at the very least. I know it was the weakest part of Fangraph's war in yeah. the projections, wasn't yeah. it? And and now I'm interested to see what that will look like now that Stevenson has been added to that. Again, because it's a reliever, they don't add a significant chunk of war considering that they're not in every single game, but sure. it really depends on the moments that they're in and then the run prevention and whatnot. So, yeah, I, I think I'm with you. I think that they have something good here. And we haven't even mentioned uh, Sam Bachman and how he's right. going to configure into right. what the Angels are doing. Mike, maybe there's even a world whether they let him cook as a starter or a reliever in the minor leagues until, you know, there's a need for him. Right. But again, I, I think that this this is like one of those things where Stevenson comes in and it it changes the entire outlook of the bullpen. Plus, plus. We've talked about this before with Carlos Estevez. Obviously, he was gassed through mm -hmm. halfway through the season and people mm -hmm. figured him out and whatnot. And and kind of the plan to start things out was having him split some time uh, and, and, and not getting all the saves. And so maybe right. this sets them up for some more options in that regard. Finally, I'll say this. There's not really a great way to project bullpen guys based on like their past history. Like I know people are saying well, Stevenson's a career for something ERA. And I get that, but you also have to consider 
like even recent success or long-term success or not long-term success don't necessarily identify a good relief pitcher. And again, I think that uh, it, it's always a toss up with a reliever. Obviously the angels felt comfortable giving him that salary because I think that he made fundamental tweaks and they can't mess with that. They cannot touch that. But honestly, if you're, if you're not Josh Hader, if you're not a world Chapman and you don't have that kind of track track record, uh, it really any reliever is going to be a crapshoot in my opinion. Yeah. And that's the hard part about bringing on any sort of bullpen piece. Cause there's just not a guarantee what they're going to do, but yeah. If I look at this team and I look at what we have, I get I get a bit excited about the potential of what they could do because we're going to see Ben Joyce a whole lot more this year. We're also possibly going to see a Sam Bachman either in AAA. That AAA team's going to cook, by the way, because they have a <laughs> lot of like major league guys down there. Um, or we could see him in the bullpen, and I think that it might be wise to stick him in the bullpen because then you get another arm who performed when he had the opportunity last season in really high leverage moments, and then. At the end of the back of the bullpen, Estevez had a lot of high leverage moments where he came through, but to have Stevenson as well helps to offset that. And so I, I get excited about this team. And then if you do bring on somebody like a Matt Moore, gosh, you're really adding to this pin. And remember, Luis Garcia is not, you know, something to just toss aside. The guy mm -hmm. is going to come in and throw gas and he's had a pretty good career and he's going to be an additive to this bullpen. And so it's interesting to see how this team is shaping up. And I know that our expectations are no expectations. And, and my gut would tell me that this team at its, on its best day in its best year can get about 80, 81 wins, but there is a lot that has to fall into place. But with this coaching staff and with this, this piece specifically, and with the knowledge that the angels are wanting to give these young guys an opportunity and not just send them away or send them down. I get excited about that and the potential of what it might take for this team to get to the playoffs after this season, because these young guys have had another year of development. Final thing I'll say is this, uh, why, why didn't, didn't the Rays bring them back? Because the Rays are not going to pay anybody 11 million dollars that's the reason right absolutely <laughs> hey thanks for making lockdown angels your first listen of the day every day is locked on has launched the first ever national sports 24 7 streaming channel on youtube it's called locked on sports today and they are there for you 24 7 covering the top sports stories of the day with local experts of locked on plus our national shows covering every league so go to locked on sports today on youtube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24 7 streaming channel hey give us a follow at Locked on Angels on Twitter and at Super Halo Bros on Twitter and Instagram. Once again, if you haven't done so, find that voting link in the episode description and vote for Locked on Angels for best baseball podcast. Come on over to YouTube, find today's show, get in the comments, whether you're watching or listening. We'd love to hear from you. Mike, what do we have on deck for Wednesday's show? Well, the Angels don't sign anybody else. We're actually going to talk about what we we're going to talk about today, and that's the international signing period that took place. We're going to talk about the guys that the Angels took and give you some of the names that we're really excited about. So that'll be Wednesday, barring any sort of move. And we'll be excited if there is a move. Yeah. We don't mind changing the schedule, right? But barring any sort of move, we're going to talk about who the Angels signed in the international signing day. And that is Wednesday on Locked on Angels. Looking forward to that. We hope you'll come back and join us again. Until then, my name is John, and that's my brother, Mike. And my name is Mike, and that's my brother, John. Thanks for being here with us, everybody. And we'll see you back here on Wednesday.